In this episode, we're returning to the Japanese concept of ikigai, which roughly translates as a person's reason for being or a life purpose. In Japanese, iki refers to life and gai signifies value or worth. This term encapsulates an ancient Japanese philosophy that profoundly influences the way the people live. Even today, it is believed that achieving a state of ikigai can increase happiness and longevity. In a previous video, we delved into the historical origins of ikigai in Japan. In this video, we'll explore established thinking about how to find it. Before we dive in, it's important to note that the Western interpretation of ikigai has largely become synonymous with career fulfillment. People often treat it as a formula akin to a Venn diagram designed to map out an ideal professional journey imbued with meaning and purpose. This makes sense when you consider the extent to our lives and our daily schedules are dominated by work. Despite this, in Japan, ikigai retains a broader significance, encompassing the value of life, the joy of life, the meaning of life, and at times, even what you are passionate about. Regardless of its social value, consequently, it may denote what brings you joy, motivates you to embrace each day, or what you're currently passionate about. Its application extends beyond major goals to encompass the minutia of daily life. Crucially, ikigai isn't reserved solely for significant accomplishments, and it can be embraced even if someone is not considered especially successful in their field. The essence lies in self-definition and finding satisfaction in the activity itself, irrespective of its significance to others. Individuals may discover more than one icky guy and its role in creating all the amazing aspects of our native culture in their lifetime. Conversely, Lacking an ikigai equates to having nothing to look forward to, a situation deemed unbearable. This underscores the belief held by many Japanese that it is indispensable for a fulfilling life. Of course, it is impossible to measure something that is so subjectively important without first establishing our own individual value system. Given the everyday pressure to conform to social norms and standards of etiquette in Japan, external factors assume a disproportionate role in shaping people's perception of themselves. Paradoxically, family dynamics, interpersonal relationships, workplace culture and wider social norms can all exert pressure to adopt certain attitudes and standards of behaviour that can all too often feel totally alien. Just like in other parts of the world, working lives and career choices assume a disproportionate level of importance in people's lives. Companies increasingly employ tactics to build leisure into the daily routine on the mistaken assumption that this allows individuals to live contentedly within the company. Despite recent high-profile cases of death from overwork, it remains difficult to overcome lingering management notions that people live to work rather than work to live. This is perhaps why the Venn diagram, 
a much overused tool in Japanese industry, has become such a popular way to map a career focused form of ikigai. In stark contrast, books on ikigai written by Japanese psychologists and psychiatrists recommend against associating one's work with ikigai. Dr. Kanji Izumiya, a psychiatrist practicing in Tokyo, offers insightful cultural observations via his contributions to Nippon.com and other platforms. The title of his book, don't make work ikigai speaks for itself. He contends that comprehending the essence of life does require an understanding of the nature of work. Dr. Uzumiya suggests that before the Industrial Revolution, craft based work could be synonymous with bliss and joy. However, with the advent of mass production, systemization and management theory, work transformed into mere labour, inducing feelings of emptiness and drudgery. In a wage economy, work is a means to eat, making it almost impossible to find the meaning of life in the workplace. Similar viewpoints have been expressed by various philosophers, economists, and social commentators about the nature of work since Japan became a leading industrial economy. In 1941, the year that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, German American social psychologist Eric Frum published his book, The Escape from Freedom. He delves into the repercussions of individualism dating back to the Renaissance, an economic revolution that still poses as a religious and cultural flowering of humanism in most history books. Fromm identifies the adverse impact of individualism that causes a disintegration of social bonds, leading to loneliness and insecurity. He posits that the fear of isolation is the primary apprehension of all human beings. Despite the apparent pursuit of freedom, individuals in their quest for autonomy paradoxically become more susceptible to feelings of alienation and loneliness. To evade this fear, they opt to escape from the very freedom they seek. A significant outcome of this dynamic, according to Fromm, is the emergence of authoritarian regimes that provide reassuringly simple answers to complex problems. He suggests that Protestantism, with its austere work ethic, can be viewed as an authoritarian system that exploited human powerlessness. Salvation lies in becoming a slave of God, emphasizing diligence and thrift. Fromm notes that this Protestant ideology played a pivotal role in the development of capitalism. Those who willingly became slaves of God subsequently embraced being slaves of capital dedicating themselves to toil and contributing to the value extraction mechanisms that divorced most individuals from the more self-fulfilling nature of craftsmanship or small-scale agriculture. As a result, capital shifted from being a means to an end, solidifying its status as a central objective in people's lives. In some ways, Japanese history confirms Fromm's theory. A manufactured combination of Buddhist and Confucian principles assumed the ideological role of Protestantism in Japan's belated adoption of Western industrialization.
Recognising that they may never achieve the economic status and stability of their parents, many young people are questioning the old value work and the goods and services it allows them access to. Of course, it is still possible to derive satisfaction from achieving good results at work, but perhaps more than at any time since the Meiji Restoration, individuals are asking serious questions about what really matters most to them. Meanwhile, contemporary psychiatrists have pinpointed three crucial problems with the idea of making work ikigai. Firstly, in the current economic landscape, the emphasis is overwhelmingly on economic outcomes. The very high short-term expectations of shareholders cannot be satisfied with the brilliance of an idea or the efficiency of a production process. Constant growth and share price inflation are the priorities that so often lead to a focus on cutting costs which has a knock-on effect on the workload of individuals. In stark contrast, ikigai is an intrinsic sentiment. For instance, there are those who consider playing the guitar is their ikigai and find fulfillment in the pure act of playing alone. Their aim is not financial success and social affirmation by forming a band or performing live. Secondly, success or failure in business is often beyond individual control. Despite one's efforts, the market's response determines the fate of a product. Entrusting the meaning of life to the judgment of an undefined number of stakeholders seems excessively risky. Lastly, in many corporate settings, personnel are replaceable. Despite assuming significant responsibilities, the belief that a company would falter without one's contribution is often a delusion. Companies continue to operate, even when key employees leave, challenging the notion of indispensability. Not even top executives can ever really claim to be needed, except when it comes to awarding themselves excessive remuneration packages. So what about artists, chefs and other self-employed people? They orchestrate their own time, make all their own decisions, provide customers with services and products that they believe have significant value. Many chefs, like the noodle shop owner in the film Tampopo, directed by Juzo Itami, find their icky guy in serving delicious food and seeing the happy faces of their customers. They travel everywhere in search of the ideal ingredients and spend day and night in the kitchen. However, whether or not a restaurant will prosper still depends on the market. In Japan, it is said that only one in 100 restaurants can be reasonably successful and last for more than 10 years we tend to shine a light on the very few successful ones and overlook those that have gone under with crippling debts. In short, even if the work itself is personally fulfilling, the challenges and complexities of the modern marketplace create a level of precariousness that places the need for high profits above personal fulfilment. and the value of art and cuisine undoubtedly suffers as a result. There was a time in Japan when placing company before family and one's own personal whims was rewarded with a strong degree of security and everyday comfort. Throughout the 1970s to the 1980s, 
Japan was described as a 100 million middle class society, in which people who worked hard at corporate jobs also had a strong desire to consume and support economic growth. There is a stubborn unwillingness to acknowledge that those days are long gone, and like most other advanced economies, Japan suffers from a level of inequality that makes it ever more difficult for both businesses and individuals to thrive. As from predicted, there is a carefully nurtured widespread assumption that anything lacking tangible value or immediate gratification can safely be deemed useless. In Japan, especially among young people, terms like tai pa, which means time performance and cost pa, which means cost performance, are an integral part of daily discourse, serving as crucial criteria for judging levels of satisfaction. Rather than delving into lengthy books, there's a preference for summaries or key points shared online. Movies have a better Tai Pa rating. If you watch them at 1.5x speed, they say. TikTok's popularity stems from the fact that each video is very short, a minute or so at most, and you don't need to waste time searching for what you want to watch. If interest isn't peaked within seconds, your partial attention is swiftly redirected. This corporate social media inspired, efficiency driven mindset now extends to wider Japanese society. Despite growing scientific evidence that allowing the mind to drift is an essential component of developing new, Innovative ideas. The always on, negative attitude towards idle time is pervasive. A packed schedule is seen as the height of fulfillment. To paraphrase John Lennon, life is what happens while you're posting snaps of your fashionable lunch to social media. Downtime spent on creativity and learning is all too often considered wasted. How many YouTube videos have you seen about generative AI that steer away from seeing it as a new creative tool rather than a quick fix way to make money without making an effort? Everything is a side hustle. Dr. Izumiya argues that breaking free from the prevailing labor cults requires fostering an environment that prioritizes finding one's true self and a true meaning of life. He proposes incorporating play into daily life, which he defines as a state in which the heart and head synergistically delight in each other. In contrast to societal perceptions, he contends that play is the gateway to genuine happiness, emphasizing the importance of spontaneous, creative activity. He advocates embracing improvisation in daily actions and challenging ingrained values of endurance, duty, and sacrifices with a focus on enjoyment and comfort. He suggests that gradually reshaping thought patterns through accessible practices is the swiftest route to a fulfilling life. His perspective gains credibility from his role as a psychiatrist, guiding those who have faced mental strain from excessive efforts. In Escape from Freedom, from aligns with Dr. Izumiya's stance, emphasizing spontaneous creative activity as a way to empower the ego, suggesting that nothing gives you more pride and happiness than thinking, feeling, and speaking for yourself. He states that if the individual realizes his ego through voluntary activity, 
and relates himself to the outside world, he is no longer an isolated atom. Stressing the psychological roots of authoritarianism, Fromm contends that overcoming the fear of freedom is pivotal for constructing a society promoting individual autonomy, social justice, and authentic human flourishing. But Dr. Zumiya's ideas appear to stir controversy in Japan. Individuals accustomed to a work-centric existence for years insist life isn't meant for leisure. This is just an unrealistically idealist or hippie idea. While others retort, nowadays, who would dedicate their life to work after all? Research indicates that Generation Z still values that now elusive stable job, but also quality time with family and friends, and dedicated time for hobbies. The crucial question is, are these preferences genuine, self-held beliefs, or are they influenced by the expectations of those around them? Recent events have highlighted the uncertainty that climate change, and in some cases highly profitable geopolitical instability and a default global economic system collapsing under the weight, extreme inequality are likely to have on the scope for quality of life choices in the future. Add in AI and digital technologies accelerating the decline of human labour into that equation and basic survival is likely to dominate the conversation. As a long-established precursor to the theories of Fromm and Dr. Izumiya, Ikigai really ought to be providing Japanese people with a way to re their true purpose and what really makes life worth living. Assuming that governments around the world finally wake up to the growing number of man-made existential threats to human life as we know it, the question remains how we psychologically adjust to new realities and avoid the self-destructive urge to seek safety in ever more brutal forms of authoritarianism. If we optimistically assume that a desperate scramble for survival isn't the most pressing priority, how will you react to freedom from work? Is it a freedom you will want to escape? The traditional notion of ikigai is about finding a rewarding state of heart and mind that lends meaning and satisfaction to the life of an individual. A sense of purpose and fulfilment that reaches deep down into our sense of humanity and purpose. For fans of traditional Japanese culture, the crafts, cuisine, even martial arts that make Japan so unique are rooted in this sense of flow, of complete absorption in an activity that is its own reward. For most of us, this a wholly unrealistic, unimaginable idea. But ideas have a habit of coming around again. And at some point in the not-too-distant future, perhaps the Venn diagram simply won't add up and we will rediscover the power of Ikigai and its role in creating all the amazing aspects of our native culture. If you enjoyed this video, please support the channel by subscribing and feel free to help us with planned future videos by commenting below. Thanks for watching.